My name is Midshipman Second Class Jen Sun, and I'm part of the Wargaming Initiative at the Naval Academy. And I'm very honored to be introducing our moderator today. Our moderator for this panel is Dr. Seth G. Jones. Dr. Jones is Senior Vice President, Harold Brown Chair, Director of the International Security Program, and Director of the Transnational Threats Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. His areas of expertise include counterterrorism and homeland security, defense strategy and capabilities, irregular warfare, counterterrorism, and covert action. Dr. Jones, we look forward to your comments. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, and thank you for uh, the U.S. Naval Institute for organizing this important discussion about warriors and attaches, the role of the military and, uh, and diplomats. I want to briefly introduce our speakers first, but before I do that, I just want to remind individuals in the audience here that we do have a microphone uh, up here for questions. So I'll try to give you a, a brief heads up before we get to the audience question and answer session so that if you want to go up and line up at the uh, microphone, we can then move uh, seamlessly into uh, to Q&A. We have a fantastic uh, panel here. Um, to my right, uh, we have Ambassador Tom Shannon. Uh, he's a senior international policy advisor uh, at Arnold and Porter, a former Under Secretary of State uh, for Political Affairs and U.S. Ambassador to Brazil. To my left, we have um, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Charles Hooper, uh, who has, is the senior counselor at the Cohen Group and has a long and distinguished career, which we'll get into in addition to serving as uh, Director of the Defense and Security Cooperation Agency. Uh, virtually, we have also two outstanding individuals. Uh, we have up on the left side of your screen, uh, we have Admiral Harry Harris, uh, who recently served as U.S. Ambassador to South Korea and also served as Commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. And we have Ambassador Deborah McCarthy, uh, fellow at Harvard University, who has served as U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania, uh, as well as uh, former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs. So a very deep set of experience across the speakers. So I, I hope when we move to the Q&A session that we have, uh, we have a range of good questions from the audience. So we'll start with a discussion on stage and then virtually. And around 10.50 or so, we'll move to, uh, to audience, both virtually and, uh, and in-person uh, questions. So let me just start with, uh, with Ambassador Shannon uh, to my right here. And I, I'm wondering if you can look back at your experience um, and to talk a little bit about how state and defense missions and diplomatic efforts have complemented each other, so where you've seen uh, good examples of cooperation across the military and state, and how, in some cases, probably they've needed to operate more effectively together and cooperate better. So what are your positive and negative experience in, in, in state defense uh, cooperation? Well, thank you very much, Seth, and it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today, uh, both here at the Naval Academy and, and virtually, and a real honor to participate on this panel. It's a really remarkable group of individuals who I think are going to be able to provide some deep insight into what diplomacy in the 21st century is going to look like and how the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Defense Department, but especially diplomats and warriors, uh, are going to be able to work together over time. And I think I would start by saying that it's common to believe that warriors and diplomats sit at opposite ends of the force spectrum and that they do different things. Uh, but my experience has been actually that we work in fairly close quarters uh, and that we complement each other in an important way. And diplomacy, at least as the United States has understood it uh, across our history, really sits at the crossroads of power and persuasion. And you, you really can't have effective diplomacy without having both. It's really a, a, a mixture and, and, and a, a measure. And, and how things are mixed and how they're measured really depends on the circumstances we find ourselves in. And one of the things that has struck me, I, I served in the U.S. Foreign Service for 35 years. I started in 1984 uh, when the Cold War was alive and well, the Soviet Union was, was still our adversary. 
Uh, and I ended in 2018 in a very different kind of world with the United States as the, really the only surviving hyperpower in the world, really the only country that still had an ability to project its power anywhere at any time, but also uh, a recognition that it, the United States did not have the ability to project its power everywhere all the time. And therefore, it had to be judicious about its use of power, and it had to build surrogates and allies and partners uh, to do things that either it didn't want to do or it preferred to keep at a, at a distance. And what has struck me over the last 20 years uh, is that because of the nature of the struggles the United States has faced and the security challenges we faced, there's actually been a remarkable integration of military and diplomatic um, processes and engagement, and not just at a large kind of interagency level, but at a personal level. And it was noted um, that there will be people who have run uh, provincial reconstruction teams and, and other kind of expeditionary efforts. What's striking is how in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, how the U.S. military, the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Agency for International Development, our law enforcement agencies and our intelligence agencies have connected in, in, in important ways to ensure that you bring whole of government approaches to problems, but also in ways that connect young military officers with their counterparts and all the other national security agencies. And for me, this is striking because um, when I started, that experience wasn't normal. And in fact, I would say that younger, especially younger diplomats today, have a much greater understanding and personal connectivity with their counterparts uh, in the different branches of the armed forces and other national security agencies than I did. And they get a much tighter experience, something that took me 15 or 20 years to accomplish, they accomplish in a much shorter period of time. And that's good and it's important because it allows for a wider perspective, better understanding in terms of how the U.S. government functions. Where things get complicated is in moments of crises, where you need to do immediate deployments or immediate expeditionary work. And I would argue that, especially in, uh, in Iraq, when the Iraq conflict turns from being one of, 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 of removing Saddam Hussein from power and to trying to establish a new government uh, in Iraq and then becomes a civil crisis and a civil war, and suddenly our PRTs, which were s stuck in a, a development mode, find themselves being under attack. Um, how you push civilians into that environment in a quick and secure fashion becomes a challenge. And, and this is where you get a, a bit of a disconnect between how the military and, the, and diplomats function. But what, what I learned uh, in this process is how quickly that can be overcome. And, and so I, I would argue that uh, as, as we look deeper into the, into the 21st century, if we can find a way to consolidate what we've learned over the past 20 years, institutionalize uh, and understand how we need to remain connected, but then look at what the terrain for um, uh, combat and battle is going to look like. Because what's becoming increasingly apparent to me is that nobody wants to take us on frontally. Nobody wants to find a way to fight the United States in a full-blown military conflict. So they're looking for other areas and terrains to fight in, whether it be in the gray zone, in hybrid conflict, whether it be in cyberspace. And, and this is where uh, we are gonna find adversaries that are our equals, and maybe even better than us. And, and this is where I think we really need to start to unlock this connectivity between our warriors and our diplomats to understand the, the 21st century environment we're gonna be in. And if we can do that, then we're gonna be successful. Thanks, I, and I, I do know we'll get back to some of this uh, if we have time. We certainly have had challenges. I mean, uh, my experience, senior levels of the uh, war in Afghanistan, there were periods of time where there were extraordinary tensions between our military commander and our ambassador there. We're, had to work through a range of issues, but I think the downsides of tension are significant, which is why the cooperative elements are so important. So, uh, General Hooper, if I can turn to you, you've, you've, uh, you've um, seen this from the military side, and what is your sense of uh, both um, important uh, complementary efforts as well as challenges? Well, thank you very much, Seth, and, and it's wonderful to be here at the Naval Academy this morning and in this distinguished group with this distinguished panel. 
I would agree with Ambassador Shannon that, that I remember when I was young, there was a very famous article, the ambassadors will remember, uh, that diplomats are from Venus and soldiers are from Mars. And, and, and I believe that, that I believe it was overblown then and certainly now. I think there's much less divergence uh, between soldiers and diplomats than there was in the past. And I think, as the ambassador said, that's a function of 21st century warfare, which is information-based. Uh, it does happen very rapidly, but it compels us to work more closely together. And I, when I look at the examples of my experiences as a, as a military diplomat, and I know some of my State Department colleagues would say that's an oxymoron, um, but I was a foreign area officer, so I was specifically trained to be a military diplomat. But in China, for example, um, I didn't go anywhere uh, without consulting first with the economics counselor, and for that matter, the economics counselor, who's a Department of State Foreign Service officer, but for that matter, I consulted with my colleagues from the Department of Commerce as well and the Department of the Treasury. Why? Because our relationship with China, our economic and security relationships, and our financial relationships are inextricably linked. Um, so even though I was the defense attache, I will tell you the economics and business courses I took in grad school were just as important uh, as the military courses. And I think it's important for all soldiers and those of you young people out there that are studying these things to understand uh, we are immersed, very immersed as soldiers in, in our military culture. But the military is but one element of national power, a very important element, but just one element. Uh, and it's important that we understand the other elements. And when I go to my experience in Africa, I was uh, the Deputy Director of Strategy, the Deputy J5 in Africa. And our keynote speaker this morning talked about how public diplomacy was instrumental in the foundation of Africa. But I found myself very much uh, as the director of strategy, uh, supplementing and supporting our diplomats on the continent. We, don't have, we didn't have a large and don't have a large military presence on the African continent. And we were there to supplement diplomacy uh, and to work with our diplomatic colleagues. Um, in my experience in Egypt in the Middle East, uh, I was there during the downturn in the relationship after the military had, uh, had seized power in Egypt. Um, and I found my relationship there to be one of we had good ties with the military, and some of our ties with the civil authorities in Egypt weren't that good. So I found myself advising the ambassador through my contacts in, in the military uh, and supplementing, once again, working with our diplomatic colleagues. So I think it's close. There have been a number of programs to facilitate that. When I was the defense attache in Beijing, I sponsored young foreign service officers, um, just as if I were a senior diplomat, had them to my house. Um, uh, many of our diplomats now attend our command and general staff colleges and our war colleges. I think that's great. So I think we're coming together, and this collaboration is absolutely essential, as the ambassador said, to our, our successful execution of foreign policy in the modern age. Great. Uh, I, I wanted to shift gears slightly. We'll, we'll come back. I mean, this whole panel is on discussing the coordination uh, between the military and diplomatic efforts. But I did want to turn briefly uh, to, to the Chinese, and I want to go to um, uh, Admiral Harris first. Um, and to, to, to shift gears a little bit by looking as, as B.H. Littlehart, who uh, I hope most of you have read a little bit of, uh, talks about the other side of the hill. And so the first question for Admiral Harris is, um, as, as, as the, the U.S. thinks through this competition, uh, and there may be elements of cooperation with the Chinese as well, but as, as the U.S. thinks through this competition, what, what is your sense, Admiral Harris, about how the Chinese are uh, combining military and diplomatic instruments? And then what I'd like to do from there is with both you and, and, uh, and Ambassador McCarthy, talk about how we think through then uh, our uh, response to that. So, so first is, is really, how are the Chinese, Chinese using military and diplomatic instruments against both the U.S. and its allies and partners in the region? Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. Let me just uh, ask uh, if you can hear me well. I'm worried about the setup in my... Yes, I uh, can hear you. Room. Okay, thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, let me begin by, uh, uh, by saying how honored I am to be here, uh, part of this uh, seminar, a part of this panel. Uh, with distinguished diplomats uh, like Ambassador Shannon and uh, Ambassador McCarthy uh, and General Hooper. So, and I agree with uh, Hoop when he says uh, that military officers, especially in the foreign area world, 
are in fact uh, diplomats. So I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this panel. Uh, I think it would be um, fitting uh, that we that I pay uh, for all of us tribute to General Powell, uh, to Colin Powell, who is the ultimate, in my view, a warrior, statesman, uh, diplomat. Uh, uh, and so I want to honor him, and I encourage everyone to uh, listen to the interview that Secretary Albright gave yesterday, uh, or day before yesterday, I guess, about General Powell and, and their relationship uh, personally uh, and professionally. I thought it was very illuminating uh, and very useful to reflect uh, on that key nexus between uh, the military world on the one hand and the dip diplomatic uh, world on the other. So uh, now to your specific question um, about uh, China uh, and, and all of that. Look, uh, we cooperate with China on a broad number of issues globally. Right. I mean, they're one of our key trading partners. Um, you know, we wouldn't have the, the very strong um, United Nations sanctions against North Korea were China not with us in that. Right. I mean, so th today uh, they may disagree with where we are with regard to sanctions in North Korea, on North Korea. But these are United Nations sanctions. Uh, not, not U.S. unilateral sanctions, for the most part. Uh, and we wouldn't have United Nations sanctions without the cooperation of the People's Republic of China. Now, that said, we fundamentally disagree with the PRC on a whole number of issues, uh, including uh, their brutal treatment of their minorities uh, in Western China, uh, their illegal claims uh, uh, to the South China Sea, uh, and, and all of the rest. You know, I, I note that Secretary Blinken, uh, during his confirmation hearing, uh, believed, he stated that what was happening in uh, Western China uh, against the Uyghurs uh, is genocide, uh, that human rights are being trampled uh, in Hong Kong. You know, this is our Secretary of State saying this. Um, and Secretary Austin, uh, at his confirmation hearing, uh, said that China is the uh, is the pacing threat for the U.S. military, and he promised strong support for Taiwan. So I, I think it's important uh, that we uh, acknowledge those positive aspects of our relationship with the PRC and what they're doing, but also acknowledge the uh, the, the world in which the PRC uh, resides and the world in which the PRC hopes to shape. Uh, in ways uh, that are not helpful to the global uh, order, in, in my view. Uh, I think that they are amateurs uh, in this business of diplomacy in the military. Uh, I think that, that this idea of this wolf warrior thing uh, is a way to hide their lack of expertise uh, in diplomacy around the world. Uh, many countries are turning uh, back uh, in some cases and turning toward in others to the United States. Uh, as their partner of choice because uh, of, the, uh, of the way that the PRC acts uh, globally. And in many ways, the PRC is their own worst enemy uh, in turning countries away from their sphere of influence and more toward ours and the rest of the free world. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, give my colleagues an opportunity to, uh, to join in. Thanks. Let me let me uh, go to, to Ambassador McCarthy, and and just before I do that, though, just to highlight, we are going to come back to Secretary Powell, General Powell, uh, a little bit later on, in part because he embodied both uh, some key lessons from the diplomatic and the the military side. So thank you, Admiral Harris, for for bringing up his uh, his legacy. Um, if if I could go to to uh, Ambassador McCarthy and just keep on this general theme. I mean, the, what Admiral Harris noted, uh, and we've certainly seen uh, um, an increase in the wolf warrior aspect of China, which does combine some aspects of diplomacy, uh, as well as you know, military instruments, and we've seen them operate in the South China Sea and the Spratleys. What is your sense, uh, Ambassador, about how we should think about dealing with the Chinese, both in terms of of uh, military, but particularly diplomatic instruments. How do we bring those together effectively to deal with a, a rising China? Thank you, Seth. And it's truly an honor to be here with my colleagues and friends. 
Uh, before I jump in to answer that specific question, I want to flag that we've spent at the Academy of Diplomacy the last four years capturing the relationship between our senior military leaders and our senior uh, diplomats. In 63 episodes of a podcast, the general and the ambassador, which is not limited to generals, it's all flag officers, uh, we've spoken about where it has worked and addressed the issues of conflicts and doing it in war zones, in natural disasters, and in normal interactions. So I think that's something we should, uh, there are lessons which I can get into uh, later on that. But to answer your question, Seth, specifically, on, in, in terms of diplomacy in China, um, I think I'll speak about three issues, which is the whole information disinformation sphere, the cyber sphere, and then economic coercion. So in the information uh, space, um, we have vis-a-vis -vis Russia developed a lot of expertise, a lot of understanding of their use of that tool, that gray zone tool. And I think you've noted, Seth, that there is a lack of information on which to analyze how China has been doing it, not only in the West, but within its sphere of influence in, in Asia. In terms of our ability to respond, we do not have a unified uh, system across uh, the, the government. We have uh, the State Department attempting to push back on disinformation, but SOCOM has stood up its own center and that is something that we need to address on how we coordinate these, uh, these issues. On cyber, beyond what we read in the papers and so forth, I want to flag that the U.S. has an opportunity, but it's going to be a rough, um, it's going to be difficult for China and Russia playing a large role, which is this new uh, U.N. Uh, cyber crime treaty that's going to be negotiated in 2022. Both China and Russia have been ahead of the game in both tabling the process and tabling a text in the case of Russia. And we need to be very much engaged in that process of setting the rules of the game. Which brings me to the issue of economic coercion, a third tool that, that China uses. And we've seen it you know, in South Korea, we've seen it in Australia, we even see it in Lithuania, the place that I was in, now that they've decided to pull out of the 17 plus one group. And in that, we use different tools to respond, both in terms of engaging with money, engaging with our business, sanctions, negotiating rules of the road, and then working also on issues related to energy coercion. So those are just three aspects of where diplomacy plays a role in addressing the challenge that is China. Uh I want to go uh, to, to stay in the room here and see if, uh, if either of our two guests have anything they wanted to add on uh, the importance of both diplomacy and military instruments in how we deal with the Chinese. So uh, Ambassador Shannon, I'm going to go to you first uh, and then uh, General Hooper. Yeah, just very briefly, just to add a couple comments because I think what Admiral Harris said and what uh, Ambassador McCarthy has said uh, are right on target. Uh, in regards to Chinese diplomacy, I, I do think that Admiral Harris is right that the wolf warrior concept is designed uh, to put up a, 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 a smoke, a smoke grenade uh, to, to, to try to hide some, some real weakness. Uh, but at the same time, the Chinese learn fast. And what I've seen, for instance, working in Latin America is that embassies that for the longest time were uh, run by um, uh, veterans of the Long March uh, and uh, Communist Party hacks that really did not have uh, much diplomatic skill at all have been replaced by um, uh, Chinese diplomats who know the language, have had uh, years working in the hemisphere, uh, and understand the cultures they're operating in. And they've become more sophisticated and much better at building the kinds of relationships um, that we're accustomed to. So although we're ahead of them, they're closing on us. <laughs> and, and for this reason, uh, we have to stay engaged and, and we have to uh, present ourselves as relevant partners, uh, especially to those countries that the Chinese are approaching economically uh, and, and commercially. Secondly, um, the, um, uh, the Biden administration's decision to conclude a, a tripartite security alliance uh, with the United Kingdom and Australia is a remarkable move. Uh, and I don't think it's been fully understood here in the United States yet. 
um, because the Australians have committed our, uh, themselves to the United States and to an, uh, an adversarial role with China uh, in, a, in an important moment uh, in, uh, in global history and one that will, they will either benefit from or they will pay for. Uh, and it's going to be a significant uh, debate inside of Australia as we move forward with our nuclear submarine uh, program with the Australians. Uh, but we have an opportunity in Australia to build a, a partner that uh, can capture everything about a U.S. defense security relationship and have that ripple through its society and its economy in a remarkable way. And if we're smart, we're going to take advantage of it. If I could just ask one follow-up question to you, Ambassador Shannon, although um, uh, Ambassador McCarthy can certainly answer this as well. What, what, how important are our uh, partner, diplomatic partners and the structures in the Indo-Pacific for this? So you mentioned the U.S., Australia, we'll add the UK into that with the nuclear sub-deal, but obviously there's also the Quad, among others. How important are these relationships as we think through countering the Chinese? The US strategy has been to surround China with democratic partners and allies. Starting in the Korean Peninsula, moving through Japan, into the Philippines, into Indonesia, the ASEAN countries of Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and then turning the corner uh, and going up into India. Uh, and, and so how we do that diplomacy is going to be important. And the Quad is new, it's important, it's still ill-defined, but the fact that there was a summit, uh, in-person summit of Quad leaders in Washington in September, and that it followed immediately the, um, the Australia-US-UK uh, tripartite security um, uh, alliance was significant because it meant um, that our quad partners were buying into that, that core concept of a U.S.-Australia-U.K. base to, to uh, a, a larger structure uh, that's designed, if not to contain China, at least to let it know that it has uh, strong U.S. partners all around it. Uh, Ambassador McCarthy, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that as well before I go to General Hooper. I was just going to quickly add that we need to also leverage all our business associations out there in the region. And one disadvantage we have right now is that we don't have a clear trade strategy, global trade strategy. We've enunciated some aspects of our trade strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. But beyond that in the region, we need to have a broader message, uh, particularly as we did not, uh, as we pulled out of the, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Thanks. General Hooper, I wanted to invite you to, from uh, in part your military perspective, other, other thoughts on how we think through countering and in some cases cooperating with the Chinese. Well, I, I wanted to comment first of all on, on this issue of Chinese public diplomacy. And while I would agree with Ambassador Shannon. I, I spent seven years in China and got to know many of their military personnel, diplomats well in my other diplomatic assignments. This is one instance where, as the President and Secretary Austin have articulated, uh, the power of our example, we as Americans, is far more effective than examples of our power, um, this issue of public diplomacy. And while the diplomats might be catching up, I've had an opportunity to encounter with Chinese military all over the world, in the Middle East, in Africa, and others, and they're not. Um, they tend to stay, for example, my, my military attache colleagues in other countries and, and the ones I experienced in Africa tend to keep to themselves, uh, very aloof, very recluse. And this is an instance where uh, the general nature and character of Americans can act very much in our, to our advantage, and that's particularly military representatives. Our keynote speaker talked about uh, some of the damage that can be done in, in countries with true presence when there's an accident or these types of things. We must all, as military personnel, be positive ambassadors of, of the United States. Look, we're not going to win this, uh, this strategic competition by trying to out-Chinese the Chinese and out-Russian the Russians. We must leverage those unique characteristics that define us as an Americans. And, and part of that is our character, our friendliness, our transparency, and our values. Um, and that's how we can combat Chinese public diplomacy. On the issue of our alliances, uh, I'm very, like everyone, I, I'm very pleased to have seen the new alliance between the Australia, U.S. and the United Kingdom, um, the, the Quad itself. Um, but what I look at and when I think of my good friend Admiral Aguilino and the challenges that he has is this issue of interoperability. 
So five of our seven treaty alliances are in the Asia Pacific region. Um, now we have the Quad, um, and we have uh, our British colleagues, Task Force 21, which includes ships from NATO and the Netherlands. So there are a lot of moving pieces now in the Asia Pacific. And the question and the challenge becomes, how do we all harmonize these different arrangements so that we create a synergy that helps us to combat Chinese aggression and Chinese efforts? And I think we need to think very strongly about how we do this. Um, people talk about the Quad as the new NATO, um, and I smile to myself because I'm not even sure NATO is the new NATO. Uh, we've been trying to talk to each other for years in Europe. So we just need to look at those challenges and, and we need to apply ourselves to ensuring that our alliances and our partnerships harmonize to create an environment that counters some of China's steps. And I'll stop there. If, if I can just move over to Admiral Harris. Uh, uh, we, we just heard from, from General Hooper on the, a little bit of the NATO experience. And I mean, I think when you look at where NATO has come and whatever you think of NATO right now, but where you, when you look at where NATO has come since its establishment in, uh, in, uh, in the post-World uh, War II period, I mean, it is an organization, it's got a military staff, it's got an, an ability and structures to um, provide information, including classified information among NATO countries, Link 16. I mean, there's nothing along those lines in the Asia Pacific. And, you know, the argument here is not that, that we, should, we should or even could create something along those lines. But from your perspective, how do we think about moving in a direction that, much like NATO, where uh, we are able to better, more efficiently bring together our military and diplomatic efforts in some kind or series of structures among countries? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, and let me uh, just build on something that General Hooper said. You know, five of our seven uh, treaty uh, treaties are in the Indo-Pacific, but 100% of our bilateral treaty alliances are in the Indo-Pacific, and that's uh, uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, Thailand, and the Philippines. So these are our bilateral treaty they are alliances that we have, and they're in the Indo-Pacific. And I was very pleased that the Biden administration, right out the chute, uh, they emphasized the importance of alliances. You know, alliances aren't luxuries, they're essentials, uh, a quote, uh, and, and all of that. So I think that that did a lot to restore confidence, uh, certainly comfort level, uh, with regard to uh, the United States uh, and our uh, alliance partners. And I think it's really important. With regard to the Quad, I'll just say that I started advocating for the Quad formally in 2016 when I spoke at the inaugural uh, Rising Dialogue in New Delhi. I was ridiculed at the time for trying to bring the Quad back. Uh, I think the Washington Post uh, um, lambasted me for that, uh, but I stood by it and I think it's important. That said, the Quad is not NATO. Right? I mean, it, it is never going to be a NATO. Uh, it is not a military alliance. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's a grouping of like-minded countries that share the same concerns and, sh and, and, and share the same democratic interests uh, that, are, uh, that, f under, that underpin uh, the Quad. You know, I, I've often talked about the Quad and, you know, people ask me, should South Korea be in the Quad? Should other countries be in the Quad? And I liken it to American college football, right? I mean, the Big Ten has 14 teams. Uh, the Big 12 has 10 teams. There's nothing that says the quad has to have four teams. But there's also, there's no gatekeeper for the quad. So earlier this year, I advocated for a, a, a secretariat kind of function for the quad. It should be resident somewhere outside the United States in one of the quad countries uh, to act as a gatekeeper to table these important issues or who should be members, what should be the criteria, and all of this, so that we can put some structure behind this very informal grouping of countries. Now, that said, we do have a new alliance relationship, treaty defense related relationship, and that is AUKUS that, that, that you brought up, that General Hooper talked about, and then Ambassador Shannon supports. I think it's a brilliant move, uh, and uh, it's, it, it, is, it is in fact, a defense 
alliance. And now, independently, we are allied already with Australia through ANZUS, that we don't extend those treaty obligations to New Zealand uh, for the nuclear issue. And we're aligned defensively with the UK through NATO. But now we have a separate grouping, uh, AUKUS, uh, which I think, by the way, is a, is a terrible acronym, but I think we're going to have to live with it because everyone uses it, and I've already used it a half a dozen times just in this single answer to your question. So AUKUS is here. Uh, I think it's brilliant. Uh, as Ambassador Shannon said, there's a lot of work to be done, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of commitment uh, on, on getting uh, uh, Australia a nuclear submarine capability. Uh, but I believe that if the, if the three countries that are involved, if we are committed to this and are willing to resource it, and we ought to be able to put a submarine, nuclear submarine in the water flying Australian colors within a decade or so, uh, you know, I mean, let's look, let's face it, you know, we, we uh, put a man on the moon in eight years uh, and we developed a COVID vaccine in one year. We ought to be able to put a nuclear submarine with Australian colors uh, in the water um, in, in a year, in, in a decade, rather. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Admiral Harris. Uh, I wanted to turn to uh, Am Ambassador McCarthy and then invite uh, if we have any thoughts um, from the floor here. Uh, and this is to pick up on a point Admiral Harris made early on. We, we had the passing this week of um, both Secretary and General Powell. Uh, and I'm just going to read a little bit of um, him, remarks he made not too long ago where, where he talked about, this, this is, it's very relevant to our discussion on, on diplomacy. Uh, he remarked that policy success comes easier when more actors work with you than against you. That, that one of diplomacy's main jobs is to arrange coalitions so that one's power and one's reputation are multiplied. The fact of power alone cannot do this because power repels as well as attracts a wise diplomacy magnifies power's attractive quality by using power to benefit others as well as oneself. And, and let me just turn to, um, to Ambassador McCarthy first. What, what lessons do you take from actions, um, the experience of Secretary Powell during his long service in government and anything that, that sort of dovetails with our discussion here on warriors and attaches? Well, first of all, the Secretary and General Powell epitomized the true uh, warrior diplomat. Uh, he was one of the finest leaders I ever served with, and in fact sent me off to my first mission to negotiate a shoot-down program in Colombia. Um, but I think to your, to your question, um, pointing to the value and the importance of both our military and our diplomats in weaving the fabric of the alliances that are one of the key advantages and key tools of the United States in advancing its national security interests. Both our diplomats and our military leaders have, uh, as I said, sewn the fabric of these alliances across the world in times of war and in times of peace. Many diplomats view this just the purview of the diplomatic side, and that is incorrect. Um, very, as you know, Admiral Harris has done in his capacities, General Hooper in his capacities, they have played an integral role in weaving um, the fabric of this necessary net that we have that enables us to do things that no other nation can do. Thank you. I want to invite. Um and e e either of you, if you want to make any comments on sure. Secretary Powell's legacy. No, happy to do that. And I would agree with Ambassador McCarthy. He was a great Secretary of State. Uh, and I had the pleasure of serving with him both at the State Department and then from the White House when I was at the National Security Council. And uh, he, first of all, cared about the Department of State. He cared about the U.S. Foreign Service and our civil service. And he invested a lot of time and energy and money uh, in the institution. In fact, he was the one who brought the Department of State, not into the 21st century, but into the late 20th century when it came to informatics. He really took us out of a word processing um, period of time and into something which was much more connected, as our um, keynote speaker this morning indicated. 
and, and, and that was hugely important uh, for how the department does its, its business. Um, but also, he and his deputy, Dick Armitage, uh, brought a very special um, attitude uh, towards how you take care of people. Uh, the idea that you bivouac with your troops, the idea that you care about where your troops live, how they treat each other, um, how they're punished and how they're rewarded um, become, became a very important part of State Department culture. Uh, and I was, was always grateful for that. So I, I consider him to be a great American and a great diplomat. I, I can't say strongly enough the, the impact that Secretary General Powell had on the nation as a whole, but on individuals and individuals like me. Um, the fact that he came from humble origins, the fact that uh, he was an African American, uh, who was able to come from humble origins and rise to the highest levels to become a statesman and a representative of, of his country, speaks volumes about the values of the United States to uh, our foreign observers around the world and nations around the world, and that the United States truly lives up to the values that it espouses. And I have spent a good part of my adult life overseas, and I cannot possibly overestimate the enormous impact that that has. When senior statesmen, senior thinkers, and representatives of the United States represent our society as a whole. Um, and so that contribution that he made, and, and that perhaps made my entire career as a soldier diplomat who happens to be an African American possible, uh, will always be a, a significant aspect of the legacy that he leaves this country. Thanks, and, and uh, uh, best to his, his, uh, his wonderful wife and, the, and, and his family, that his legacy will certainly remain, as I think uh, all of us uh, can attest to. Let me just turn um, uh, to Admiral Harris, but before I do, just a reminder to folks here that uh, we're going to turn the next three or four minutes to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, just make, make sure you make your way up to the microphone, which is, uh, which is above uh, this set of seats here, and, and we'll turn to you. Let me go to, um, to, to Admiral Harris. The, I, I'm purposely asking you this, although I'll ask uh, Ambassador McCarthy after you. The Pentagon budget. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about, about uh, diplomatic and, and um, military issues, cooperation, some tension, but the, the Pentagon budget dwarfs that of the State Department. So my question to you is, is that an imbalance uh, if the State Department is going to be much more of a leading agency overseas, does it deserve should we provide it more of a, a, a greater budget? And I think as part of that, uh, what, what, what else should it be doing? During the Cold War, uh, as folks I'm sure remember, and if you don't, go back and look at the huge amounts of work that our U.S. Information Agency or the Foreign Broadcast Information Service uh, was involved in in part of public diplomacy. But I think starting with you, Admiral Harris, what, what's your sense about the budgets and whether we're at a state of imbalance right now. Yeah, so um, I, I do think we're in, a, in an imbalance. But I, I want to caution people who, who would think that they need to be equal. I mean, it, you know, that, the size of, of DOD, you know, the, the, the size of the troop force uh, in the Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, Space Force, uh, Army, uh, is much bigger than the, the size of the Foreign Service. Uh, and so, you know, if, if I, I think, I'm, and I'm, I've never gone through this drill, but you, you should look at the cost per troop and the cost per Foreign Service officer and see what that is. That said, for sure, the, the State Department budget is woefully inadequate to meet the challenges that the United States places and the American citizen expects uh, of our State Department. It is, it is, it has become a political issue so that uh, Congress, for, uh, for, for many reasons, will, will take cuts out of the 
uh, out of the State Department budget. The White House will reduce the State Department budget, at least the previous administration did, tried to do. And Congress, in, in this case, actually uh, uh, upped it back to where it was at least functional. But the State Department budget is, in my opinion, woefully uh, inadequate. And I'm reminded of what General Mattis said one time when he was asked about that. And he said something to the effect that if you uh, cut the State Department budget, I'll have to buy more ammunition. Uh, and that's what Jim Mattis said. And I, I, and I associate myself with that comment completely. I mean, you can't have it like, uh, the, you know, the famous French Foreign Minister Talleyrand once said to his marshal, uh, uh, Marshal Ney, uh, he said to General Ney, he said, you know, when my profession fails, yours must come to the rescue. I mean, that's binary and doesn't work for us in the 21st century. Certainly it doesn't work for the, for the United States in the 21st century. The State Department and the military must operate hand in hand uh, together with a common set of goals established by the White House and we move forward. But when the State Department's budget is as inadequate as I believe it to be today, then, then we have this imbalance uh, and we have to go forward and we have to uh, you know, advocate for increase in the State Department's budget, perhaps not uh, at the expense of a decrease in DOD's budget. I mean, DOD's mission is different uh, than the State Department's mission, but that doesn't mean that, that the State Department's budget should not be increased. I believe it must be increased uh, if we're to make uh, diplomacy uh, the focal point of our efforts uh, global. Ambassador McCarthy, over to you. And, and actually, if, if you want to supplement the, your answer to that question with any examples from the case studies that you mentioned earlier, that might be interesting as well. But over to you. Certainly. Well, I totally agree with Admiral Harris. It's comparing apples and oranges to some extent. But the fact that the State Department budget has been flat for years, rescued, believe it or not, under the last administration by a bipartisan group, which I think is something to build on, but it has been flat and includes in the figures that you gave, Seth, all of our official development assistance. So as we talk about China, talk about an imbalance on official development assistance. And three specific areas that I think have to be urgently looked at and where they do need um, additional resources. One, simply not enough people. There is no float and there is no big team devoted to any kind of planning. The policy planning section of the State Department consists of something like 20 people. That is it. And that makes it difficult to address new challenges. Two, in training. On average, a senior Foreign Service officer gets between 33 and 36 days of training in their entire senior career. Compare that to our military. That is a, no time to think, no time to step back. Only the few get to go to places like NDU and, and more should go. And last but not least is on the communication side, which you raised, Seth, which is we need a better communication tools, let alone a new communication strategy. But simply today, we don't even have a, 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 an ability to provide visuals in, in terms of promoting our messaging. Uh, and that, that is a big disadvantage uh, for our diplomacy as a whole. So if I can just, uh, just ask a follow-up, Ambassador McCarthy. So the state's got its Global Engagement Center it, it's not funded, resourced, like the institutions that the U.S. Had, state had during the Cold War. Is that a major area on the public diplomacy side? And I, I say that in part because, as we've already talked about with the Chinese, we have a, a robust, well-funded Chinese information campaign. And, and I, I find it interesting, even the terms that the Chinese have used uh, three warfares, it is a component for the Chinese of warfare. This is not warfare in the Clausewitzian sense where it's violence, but one of the key parts of China's three warfares is public relations, in addition to lawfare and psychological uh, operations. But it's public relations and media activity. So when it comes to Global Engagement Center and broader public diplomacy, uh, do, we, do we start from scratch? Do we build on what exists right now at State? What are, what are your thoughts? 
We have a remarkable team of public diplomacy officers. Of course, they could use more, um, but they tend to be reactive. I mean, the messaging that comes out uh, on the, you know, uh, on issues of the day is extremely slow. They need to, they need to speed it up and need to have tools to speed it up. On the Global Engagement Center, it has a specific amazing mandate weekly resourced and lives as part of the big public diplomacy universe. And there's a reluctance, and I think it's natural and I would agree with it, that entire PD team doesn't want to become information warfare specialists, but they do need more to be more nimble to provide basic messaging. We also have the US Agency for Global Media, which though decimated before is now coming back slightly separate mandate, but a very useful tool. But what I get back to is in doing this more as a whole of government, doing it across with our military colleagues, this is where we can easily do slightly more work to line up what some of our combatant commanders are doing in terms of information operations with what state has. I think there's work, to, more work to be done. And in fact, is on one of our podcast episodes with um, with Admiral Kirby, we talked about integrating some of our public diplomacy people between DOD and, and Department of State. And bless his heart, he has pulled in a senior public diplomacy officer into his team. It took, you know, bureaucracy almost killed him, but he managed to do it. So I think there's more work to be done besides the general lack of resources. But if we don't get our messaging to be tighter, faster, smoother and more strategic, we are at a, at a disadvantage. Thank you. Uh, let me turn, I think we've got a question up at the microphone, so if you can just identify yourself and, and uh, over to you. Yes, uh, good morning, Dr. William Devlin. I'm a missionary pastor in the war zones in Central Asia and in the Middle East and in Africa. I also serve on the steering committee of the Washington, D.C. International Religious Freedom Roundtable. We have State Department people that are a part of that. Joint Chiefs have visited. And we are working in countries around the world on public diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis religious freedom. I know we haven't talked about that yet this morning. But if you could just, whoever would like to address the issue of how public diplomacy can be used in some of the fractious nations of the world in the war zones related to religious freedom. Uh, we've seen, we have about 125 people that serve on this round table in DC, and we've seen actually great movement forward in very troubled places on the issue of religious freedom. So if you could just uh, whoever addressed the issue of religious freedom uh, as it pertains to ambassadors, warriors, and the military, and uh, would be a great help. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Who wants to uh, uh, jump on that first? It's a grenade I can land on. Um, it's a tough question, but a really important one. I can remember going to the Vatican at one point in, in one of my journeys when I was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and meeting with the Cardinal who was in charge of Catholic communities throughout the larger Middle East, but especially Iraq. And this gentleman could barely contain his fury at us for what he considered to be the actions of the United States that had shattered a very finely constructed Iraqi society and had opened it to um, more aggressive fundamentalist jihadist movements that were going after these very small, either Catholic or Christian or Jewish or Yazidi communities that were scattered through, through, uh, through Iraq and through Syria and had been there for hundreds if not thousands of years. Uh, and, and so we, when, when we talk about religious freedom and, and how religion plays into diplomacy, we actually have a, 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 a challenge set which is quite large, which is how you address kind of fundamentalist extremism in whatever religion it might be, uh, how you preserve religious plurality or pluralism in the areas where it has existed historically, 
and then how you help states that are trying to maintain a stable security environment while they deal with the flux and flow of, um, of religious change in, in the world. And this requires, I think, extraordinary, if not hyper-attention uh, to what is happening in each of these countries and each of these societies. And Central Asia, for me, is a, an especially interesting point because all of these uh, nation states in Central Asia are fairly new because they were created out of the, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. But of course, under the Soviet Union, they were, um, they were atheist. There was no religion at all permitted by the Communist Party, or if it was there, it was repressed in a significant way. And so what we've seen over the past 30 and 40 years is kind of the reemergence of religious structures, uh, both Islamic, Orthodox, and, and others. Uh, and, and how the states manage that revival of, of religious belief and, and the, the public, uh, the obvious public interest in it becomes hugely important to how the rest of the world sees them. And, and this is where our engagement uh, actually helps this process be because it connects these countries and their societies to a larger world. And it gives them a degree of encouragement to ensure that these religious communities can reform themselves, but, but do so in ways uh, that don't necessarily affect the, the stability and public order of the countries. But it, it's, it is a, an area of diplomatic work that is new, and it shouldn't be given the fact that American missionaries have been all over the world for about two centuries. Uh, and in fact, all of our great early Middle Easterners, uh, all our great Arabists um, came out of missionary families, and all of our early China hands came out of missionary families. <laughs> Uh, uh, so one would, one would think that there'd be kind of a, a, a larger respect and understanding for the impact of this in our, in our diplomacy, but it really is a, a fairly new issue uh, for the Department of State and for the American government, and it's, it's one that we, we need to do a lot of consultation on. Thank you. Great answer. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and and a, a two finger for you, Ambassador Shan. Uh, we've talked a little bit about budgets, and clearly it's more than just about budgets, but uh, state uh, compared to other organizations, including the Department of Defense. What, what is your general sense of, of the funding and the broader resource support that state has? And how, how would you, I mean, what, what would be ideal in your, in, uh, from your standpoint? Well, we'll take all the money we can get, anything that'll fit in the bag. Uh, but but I, first of all, what Admiral Harrison, Ambassador McCarthy said is right on target. Um, it's a mistake to compare and contrast the Department of State and the Department of Defense. The Department of State doesn't have aircraft battle groups. It doesn't have fleets of aircraft. It doesn't have forts. It doesn't have military bases scattered around the world. It's, it's a very different kind of organization. When we show up somewhere, we show up with a smile and a spoon. And that's how we do our business. Um, and um, But that said, what Ambassador McCarthy noted is important. It's not about money, it's about people. Uh, we need to have more people to do the kind of work we're doing. When I came into this business um, in 1984, you could count kind of the priorities of, of U.S. diplomacy on one hand. There were things like political security arrangements, um, political military arrangements, economic and commercial arrangements, and then human rights. Today, what the diplomats have to deal with is every theme imaginable, um, like religious freedom, which we just talked about. Um, when I started in 1984, I never would have thought that dealing with religious issues and religious organizations was going to become a centerpiece of how we engaged in societies. But that is now the case. And every time there is a, a new and important theme in the world, it, it drops into a diplomatic bucket. And so our ability to understand this expanding universe and our ability to, to help the U.S. government and, and the U.S. national security bureaucracy respond to this environment uh, is going to be key to our success. And, and we just don't have enough people to do it. Uh, if, if, uh, I, I know we've got a question from the audience, but I'm going to go to uh, uh, General Hooper for a moment. And, and there's a question, uh, a virtual question, which I'm going to read for you. Uh, it's the second one, which is, um, and, and I suspect Admiral Harris may have a view on this as a former combatant commander as well. But General Hooper, for you, do, do military commanders, particularly COCOM commanders, 
generally resist being pulled too far into the diplomatic process by foreign nations that prefer to deal with the U.S. military instead of the State Department? Well, and, and, and certainly, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yield the majority of my time to Admiral Harris, who has served in both capacities and far more qualified to answer this question than me. But what I will say as someone who has served as a defense attache, as a general officer twice, I would tell you that in my experience, uh, most combatant commanders clearly understand uh, the boundaries between um, their authority and their ability to act as a, as a diplomat and deferring to the ambassador in those respective countries. And, and for my part, I've, I've never experienced a combatant commander who exceeded that at the expense of the ambassador's prerogative. And I would say part of the role of the defense attache um, in, in those instances is to be that day-to-day -day liaison between the mission and the combatant commander to advise the, the combatant commander on where that balance lies and to advise the ambassador on, on the current situation so that those relationships do not fall out of balance. And, and as a defense attaché to Beijing and, and a defense attaché to Egypt, uh, I, I clearly identified that as a mission of mine to make sure that both of my bosses and uh, defense attaches have like 10 bosses. So um, the ambassador, the combatant commander, the service chiefs, the chairman, and everyone else. But I saw it as my role to advise the combatant commander, uh, sir, I know that the military is going to you for this, but they're trying to avoid talking to the ambassador. We need to shift back to him. Or correspondingly saying, you know, ambassador, this might be something where the combatant commander might be able to make a, little, a bit more progress. So we're a team working together. Uh, and the defense attaché plays a critical role in making sure that that does not happen. Thanks. So let's transition then from the defense attaché over to Admiral, uh, Admiral Harris and the combatant commander. Your, your, your perspective on this as, as, uh, from, from your position at Indo, Indo PACOM. Yeah, so I, I agree with General Hooper and how he framed the relationship between uh, the combatant commander uh, and the uh, forward uh, defense uh, attaches. Um, there, and that relationship is very important. But I did push the envelope, and I think I did so because of the importance of the issues at hand. I, I hesitate to, to name the country uh, because you would immediately understand who the ambassador was, uh, and I don't want to get into, a, get into that issue. But there was a country uh, in the Indo-Pacific that we were um, close partner with that the ambassador did not want uh, me uh, as a combatant commander, me personally as a combatant commander to enter the country because it would validate, and in the ambassador's view, uh, it would validate some of the positions uh, against which the United States uh, took umbrage, so to speak. I believe that it was critical that I go to that country because of our defense relationships inside the country and our obligations to that country. But the ambassador gets to say, uh, but not the final say. So I, I had to work around the ambassador through Congress, in some cases, uh, through State Department and others, and through OSD uh, to, uh, 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 to uh, overcome the opposition uh, from the embassy in that country in order for me to get entry into the country. So then, I could give speeches and deliver the message from the United States that we were unhappy with certain aspects of how that country was uh, acting. But I felt, though, as the combatant commander, uh, that there was a, a role for what I call military diplomacy, and it was critical. Uh, and for us to achieve our military objectives, because that's the, the mission of the combatant commander, I had to have access to that country uh, and ultimately uh, was able to prevail but it took years uh, to get to that point. Um, I, was helpfully, I was helpfully advised by uh, a very strong team of POLADS, uh, political advisors from the State Department that was assigned to uh, Pacific Command. There were three, a senior POLAD, a uh, mid-level, and an entry-level foreign service officers. They were terrific. Uh, and my obligation to the State Department uh, was that the POLAD uh, that traveled with me, whichever one uh, uh, was assigned to the, uh, to the particular trip that I went on, uh, that POLAD sat in on every meeting that I had 
with my counterpart uh, 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 in, in country, whether that counterpart was military uh, or diplomatic. Uh, you know, I, I met with uh, defense ministers and foreign ministers, and in some cases, uh, heads of government on a routine basis. Uh, in one case, uh, the embassy in, in another country uh, did not want me to meet with the foreign minister of that country. But, uh, you know, uh, we prevailed, uh, and the defense attaché was actually the, re the, 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 the principal roadblock to me meeting with the foreign minister uh, in that country. But again, we prevailed, and that meeting was a very positive meeting uh, and uh, helped me downrange uh, in, 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 in many ways. So the combatant commander gets a vote. Uh, the combatant commander gets a big vote. Uh, and uh, there are ways uh, to, uh, uh, to work through the system, uh, and there are ways to work around the system in order to achieve the ends that the command commander believes uh, is the right way to pursue the objectives uh, that he's given or she's given, depending on the command commander. Thanks. Interesting case study of uh, tensions and ways to, to deal with them. I wanted to go next to, uh, we've got a question from the audience, so if you can identify yourself and, and, uh, and ask. Thanks. Thank you, sir. My name is Lieutenant Commander Matt Johnson. I'm a former service warfare officer. Now I'm a foreign area officer focusing on European issues, working at the Pentagon. I wanted to circle back to the topic we had about harmonization. Uh, it's certainly a very critical thing that we need to get all of our partners working together, but also working internally. Uh, I'm going to segue with an example that uh, I think we all understand that the AUKUS uh, treaty is a very positive step forward. Uh, however, that announcement was made right in the middle of the Chief of Naval Operations International Sea Power Symposium up in Newport, Rhode Island in mid-September. Uh, certainly caught uh, some foreign partners off guard, and I would say, frankly, caught some internal U.S. government partners off guard. Uh, it's exacerbated by the fact that the theme of that symposium was strength and unity. So clearly we have some work to do when it comes to operating internally. Um, with that, moving forward to a place like uh, the Indo-Pacific where we have uh, the German ship Bayern operating out there, the Charles de Gaulle strike group, the uh, Queen Elizabeth with our Netherlands partners, not even counting uh, the other bilaterals with Japan, Australia, and everybody else. This is a very complicated problem. So. What I actually I'm going to ask the panel for is some concrete examples and steps that we can take, because uh, harmonization is a great ideal, but it's not a COA. It's not a course of action. It's a, it's a desired end state. But from the multiple decades of experience from each of the panelists serving in uh, the diplomatic side, uh, either in uniform or in a civilian capacity, what steps, what specific concrete things would you recommend to improve the internal uh, US government and on the external to our foreign partners? Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll begin the answer and then defer to my other panel mates. Um, in terms of concrete examples, if you look at the Pacific Deterrence Initiative that was forwarded by Admiral Davison, endorsed by Admiral Aguilino, um, and this is the, the array of capabilities uh, that the, the uh, Indo-Pacific commander believes are necessary in order for us to move forward, command control and communications is at the top of that list. So that's the first concrete example. Um, the second one I would offer is that uh, I agree with Admiral Harris, and, and while the Quad is not, and nor is it intended to be, a military arrangement, there have been the establishment of a number of working groups in the Quad, and one of those working groups speaks to interoperability. This issue of being, a, of, of these, of the respective military forces in the Quad being able to work with each other. I, I think the example you see in British uh, uh, Carrier Task Force 21 where we have a Netherlands ship, we have the USS the Sullivans that's also assigned, is this effort to, to further, um, further our efforts uh, to institute interoperability and the ability. So when we say harmonize, it, it's not just a, a, a cloudy aspirational goal. There are clear steps necessary here um, to effect interoperability and command control and communication. I would lastly say as a security cooperator, one of the things that I was focused on before I retired was what we have essentially in, in, in our alliances and partnerships is a series of hub and spoke uh, command control and communications relationships. Bilateral agreements with our treaty allies, bilateral agreements within the AUKUS, uh, NATO, and the Quad that, that dictate how we communicate with, the, with each of our partners 
in this regard bilaterally. What we need to move towards uh, is a more network-based approach. Uh, so for example, we, we have an agreement with the Indians that essentially says that all information we share with them stays proprietary between us and India and not to be shared with anyone else. And so we're going to have to come to some arrangements uh, within these various alliances, arrangements, and partnerships that allow us to talk to each other um, so that we may gain synergies from that. And so those are some of the concrete steps that are being taken that I'm aware of uh, to facilitate the harmonization that I mentioned earlier. I, I would agree with, with everything the, the general has said. I would also um, congratulate the, the gentleman who asked the question for being a foreign area officer. It's an incredible program. And I've worked with many foreign area officers across the, the course of my career. And they really are remarkable warrior diplomats. And so especially for the midshipmen here who are considering what their career might look like, I would urge them to take a, a close look at, at this possibility as they, they look deeper into their, their military careers. Um, but, you know, so, so I'll, I'll address internal um, harmonization in the U.S. government because I've had the opportunity to work not only in a major kind of foreign affairs agency, the State Department, but also uh, twice at the National Security Council at the White House and seen how the U.S. government tries to organize and, and ensure that there's a degree of communication and socialization of decisions. And it's really challenging because it's a huge government, it's a globally deployed government, and it's always in motion. Uh, and how you ensure that everybody understands what everybody else is doing is challenging, uh, especially in environments in which some people think that you advance by withholding information. Uh, my uh, experience is that you advance by sharing information and, and trying to implicate as many people in, in a decision as possible, and then ensure that the, you implicate as many people in the implementation of that, that decision as, as possible. And that really requires constant work. Um, and it is, it, it is, it is never easy, but, but it is, I really think it needs to be built into how diplomats, warriors, and others understand their relationship within their agencies, within their departments, uh, and, and beyond. And it's, it's something that isn't going to be solved uh, with a, an, a new organizational chart or a single diktat uh, or executive order. It's something that really has to be built into the culture of institutions. It has to be mentored over time. Uh, and it, my, my experience has, has been that the, the more people you draw into a decision, uh, the, the stronger it will be over time and the more enduring it will be. Thanks, uh, Ambassador Shannon. I wanted to uh, uh, move to the, uh, there's a virtual question that I wanted to uh, first give uh, Admiral Harris the chance to answer. It's, it's a Taiwan-related question. Uh, so, and let me just read it, um, uh, and then I, I see we've got another uh, uh, individual from the audience with a question as well. Uh, we're almost at time up, but I think we can get both of them in. So Admiral Harris, first to you. With the U.S. partnering with Indo-Pacific nations and Western powers and the Chinese continued escalating and challenging our naval forces, do you foresee any type of military action, especially regarding Taiwan? And I'll just tack on a question to that too. In response to that, how do we think about the combination of military and diplomatic efforts either to deter or, if there is military action, how to respond? Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you repeat the beginning, the first part of the question? I'm not sure I understand the question itself before I can answer Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just read it one more time. Um, with with the, the U.S. partnering with Indo-Pacific nations in Western powers, and the Chinese escalating and challenging our naval forces, do you foresee any type of Chinese military action, particularly regarding Taiwan? And I think in, in, uh, for, uh, uh, from that standpoint, too, with, with regards to Chinese military action on Taiwan, how do you potentially deter that? Or if there is action, respond to it? And really, how do we think about using both military and diplomatic efforts there? Yeah. Uh, well, sit back. It's taking about two hours to answer that question. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but I've got the time. I'm retired. So let me let me begin by saying that um, you know the military's job is to be prepared for all 
eventualities or contingencies. So clearly, Indo-PACOM is thinking about the PRC's threat to Taiwan uh, and, and all that. So whether, whether it happens or not, uh, at this point, is, is not the important thing. The important thing is to be prepared for if it happens. And then it depends on, on, on uh, you, you know, on the White House and the National Command Authorities on what the action will be. Uh, it, I have to say, I have to make the statement that we are not obligated to defend Taiwan. We are obligated by law to ensure that Taiwan has the ability to defend itself. And we encourage uh, uh, both primary parties here, Taiwan uh, and the PRC, to work this out peacefully to uh, arrive at whatever the, the ultimate uh, solution there is peacefully. But the Taiwan Relations Act uh, is, is law, and it determines how we approach uh, Taiwan and what our obligations to Taiwan are. And General Hooper is key is key to that, or his, his previous uh, um, uh, organization is key to that, to ensure that, that we make available to Taiwan the things uh, that are, um, are best, uh, 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 best provided to defend Taiwan. And so there is, a, there is a tension between us and our partners in Taiwan on how they should, uh, on what they should buy, for example, to defend themselves. So the, that, that's an ongoing tension, uh, but we exacerbate that tension at the national level when we don't provide uh, uh, equipment for Taiwan's purchase in, in an organized fashion. You know, we'll, we'll have these Taiwan arms sales uh, uh, every now and then, and they're big, and so they, they create a lot of, uh, uh, they create a bow wave of controversy with the People's Republic rather than have a steady state, but these are politically driven decisions uh, rather than, than uh, market driven decisions uh, or even defense related decisions. So I'm, I, I think that we can do better, we should do better, we must do better with our partners uh, in Taiwan to ensure that they can defend themselves uh, uh, against the PRC so that ultimately whatever happens with regard to the relationship between Taiwan and the PRC happens peacefully. Um, and, and, and both countries won. So we have had a, a uh, policy uh, for the last uh, 50 years or so uh, called strategic ambiguity with, with regard to Taiwan. You know, if the PRC attacks Taiwan, is the United States going to defend Taiwan? So there is a, an element of strategic ambiguity there so that uh, it, 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 uh, this ambiguous position of the United States acts as a deterrent against the PRC attacking Taiwan on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it acts as a deterrent for independence movements in Taiwan to declare independence. I believe today, and I've said this publicly now uh, since uh, for the last couple of months after thinking about this quite a bit, I think that the era of strategic ambiguity uh, must end. I think it's now in 2021 a time for strategic clarity with regard to Taiwan so that the PRC clearly understands what the United States will do uh, if they proceed uh, in a military way to unify with Taiwan. Uh, and so I think that the era of strategic uh, ambiguity uh, must end uh, and, the, and the era of strategic clarity must begin. Now there's, there's a halfway house, I guess. Somebody wrote an article recently uh, in one of the journals, I talked about a, a policy of strategic coherence. I, I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm a simple guy. I, I think that I understand strategic ambiguity. It has served the United States well uh, since its inception in the early 1970s. But that time is ending. And I think the era of strategic clarity, I understand that completely. Uh, and I think we, that our obligation is to be clear to our friends, allies, partners, and others on, on what uh, the United States will do if certain conditions are met. Thanks, Admiral Harris. I think we have time for one last brief question. So if we can go to the audience, you can just make sure you identify yourself and, and who you're asking the question to, and then we'll wrap it up. This question will be directed towards the Department of State panelists. Uh, 
I'm a study track South Asia Foreign Area Officer, Major Joe Mesmer. My question is related towards, on the panel today, we've talked about the importance of increasing the budget for the Department of State, increasing training, increasing staffing, and things related to that. When we're talking about our primary posts in our major allies and partners uh, being in place by political appointees as ambassadors, what is the consequence, both positive and negative, for having political appointees, vice, career foreign service officers uh, taking care of these positions? And additionally, the degree uh, to the consequences in the cyclic turnover of ambassador posts, where posts of smaller destinations tend to be controlled by uh, DCMs acting as charge d'affaires for extended periods of time uh, with the absence of a acting ambassador. So let me first, uh, 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 interesting question, let me first uh, turn to um, Ambassador McCarthy uh, to see if she has a uh, response to that. First of all, to answer uh, the question, built into the Foreign Service Act of 1980 and respectful of the presidential prerogatives, the president has the ability to nominate whomever he or she pleases. Uh, I personally have worked for many political ambassadors, outstanding, bringing new uh, elements into our system, asking the questions of why not to the bureaucrats. Um, that is not to say that every appointee across the centuries has been, you know, stellar. Um, to the gaps that occur, and that is, I think, a more serious issue, to the gaps that occur, um, they do not result in a reduction of internal effectiveness, but they do result in a gap in terms of messaging and effectiveness in engaging with uh, local countries. But it's a system that we have that is built in, and it will continue. And as I said, those that I have worked with, and I would say primarily those that I've engaged with that have been political appointees, have added and not taken away from the system. Um, given the dearth of people, given our inability to be trained, uh, our, uh, as I mentioned, I think bringing in new people at the top has added and shaken us up on occasion. Thanks. And uh, uh, Ambassador Shannon, anything you wanted to add before we hand this over to uh, Vice Admiral Daly to wrap the panel up? I, I, first of all, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a great one. Uh, I would agree with Ambassador McCarthy. Um, uh, presidents can choose who they want to, to be their personal representative, and we just have to understand and respect that. Um, but we can demand that they choose the very best people um, and, and try to hold them to standards uh, over time, and I, I think that's important. Um, but, but I would actually argue that the, the greatest threat facing American diplomacy right now is the inability of the United States Congress to confirm um, uh, nominees to be ambassadors. Uh, the Biden administration has one successful uh, a nominee confirmed, the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. All the other nominees are being held uh, in the Congress for one reason or another. And I consider that to be uh, legislative malpractice. Uh, it's very harmful to the United States, uh, that inability uh, to put our people in the field uh, and, and to put ambassadors in the field, it, it it's, um, hurts us, and I, I just don't understand it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very discouraging to see that uh, also on other uh, uh, federal government appointees as well. Well, I, I just want to thank uh, the panelists for a fantastic session. Um, Admiral Harris, General Cooper, uh, Ambassador McCarthy, and Ambassador Shannon, thanks for a ri rich discussion on the military and diplomacy and the uh, importance of both aspects in U.S. foreign policy. So with that, I will turn this over to um, Admiral Daly. Well, thank you. On behalf of the Naval Academy and the Naval Institute, we thank the panel for a superb discussion. We covered a lot of ground here, and it was excellent. So I want to thank, again, Ambassador McCarthy, Admiral Harris, General Hooper, Ambassador Shannon, and our moderator, Dr. Jones. Thank you very much. Let's give him a big hand. Thanks. 
Each of our panelists will also receive the two Naval Institute Press books, the Herndon Climb, and a Quiet Cadence. I also want to remind our attendees that after this session, please grab a box lunch in the lobby. If you're a mid, you can grab a pizza in the lobby. If you want to trade with your friends, I'll leave that to your negotiations. <laughs> and we'll be back here at 12 noon for Secretary Panetta. Thank you again to our panel. Appreciate it.